Right, I'll get started. Uh, my name is Lizzie Barnes. I'm one of Maris's colleagues here at Queen Mary, and I want to welcome you all uh, to her inaugural lecture, most particularly, of course, Maris's family and friends. We're delighted to have you here. This is a celebration on all sorts of levels. Queen Mary and the School of Law are delighted that Maris is being inaugurated as one of our professors. An inaugural is also a significant and, I have to say, slightly terrifying moment in the life of a scholar. And for their support team, a good number of you are here, in particular Maris's, in particular Maris's family, that is one of the reasons it's such a pleasure to have you all here. Maris's scholarly life is characterised by deep commitment to securing recognition and respect for fundamental human rights at the national domestic level. Her work has in many ways and forms from distinguished journal articles in very difficult to publish in uh, journals to 140 character tweets, <laughs> defended and explored the embedding of these values in the UK's national life. This is another way, if I may say so, that the UK in general and the Academy here in particular have benefited from migration to these shores, in this instance from Australia. Maris's book, Human Rights Law, which is really two books in one because it was written once in 2006 and then pretty much rewritten in 2014, is the go-to source for enabling many people to understand and to make sense of UK human rights law, generations of students included. That she has done this work exemplifies also Maris's seriousness and dedication as a teacher, making sure that UK human rights law takes its full place in the law curriculum. And her accessibility, as well as her tenacity and, dare I say, feistiness about advocating for human rights, is present in, also in her highly respected interventions in public and policy debate about the protection of human rights, especially in the face of serious recent threats, for example, to the Human Rights Act 1998, and now as a result of Brexit. So we can really know and be proud that Maris could not be better placed to give her lecture tonight on what next for a UK Bill of Rights. And I'll invite her to take it. Great. So um, I am going to wear my glasses. I wasn't going to wear my glasses. I keep on going through various permutations. I could take them on and off. But, um, so thank you, Lizzie. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It's really great to see so many of you, students, friends, colleagues, former colleagues. It's amazing uh, that you've come along. And I must admit, in the midst of Brexit and the passage of the EU withdrawal bill through Parliament, it does seem a little odd to be talking about what next for a UK Bill of Rights to replace the Human Rights Act. Even the government is not talking about it anymore, uh, having made a very vague commitment earlier this year that it might return to the issue once the process of leaving the EU is completed, if, if that ever is completed. <laughs> so why am I talking about it now? And a few people have suggested to me that I run the risk of stirring up a hornet's nest of disturbing a sleeping dog that I should let lie. And someone also said to me that I should be grateful that it is the EU we are leaving and not the European Convention on Human Rights. Stop complaining, I have been told. If people like you just shut up, everything will be okay. 
So, whilst it may be a, a little unusual at the present time, I am definitely not the first to talk about replacing the Human Rights Act with the Bill of Rights. As scholars of the relatively short history of the Human Rights Act will know, talk of a UK Bill of Rights has been around for a very long time, almost since the Human Rights Act came into force, and even before that. And shortly after the 2nd of October 2000, the uh, then Labour government started talking about the Human Rights Act as a first step on the road towards a UK Bill of Rights. <coughs> Talk of uh, UK Bill of Rights has also generated some fairly uh, lengthy and detailed reports. And I've, I've got the selection here, and there's quite a few, you'll be, you'll be surprised. Uh, Justice in 2007, Joint Committee on Human Rights in 2008, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission also in uh, 2008, Report of the Labour Government in 2009 on its way out, and of course, the report of the Commission on a Bill of Rights in 2012. But these reports have gone nowhere, and, and talk of reshaping the Human Rights Act into a modern Bill of Rights essentially stalled in 2010. The question, as many observed at the time, kicked into the long grass for fear that any reshaping guided by a Conservative government in coalition or otherwise would result in a drastic weakening of protection. And these were fears that were borne out by the Conservative Party's consultation paper of 2014, where it called for the UK to leave the European Convention on Human Rights should the Council of Europe not agree to its, its plans for national human rights law reform. And I, I'm, all, I'm not going to go into those in great detail, but I, I, just to summarise, I think they were essentially, human rights are great, the government gets to decide what they are, and human rights are only going to be for some people. So we've just got a few slides here, uh, the people that human rights are going to be for. Um, so today, get rid of that, rather than waiting for the government to inform us that human rights are to be cancelled and then obsessing over the exact way they're going to do that, uh, my objective is to reclaim the debate about the future direction of human rights law in the UK by focusing on a, on a few questions. What is the purpose of a Bill of Rights? Do we have a Bill of Rights fit for purpose? And what needs to change in order for us to get one? So in short, what next or what should be next for a UK Bill of Rights? So the first question I'm going to pose and answer this evening is, what is the purpose of a Bill of Rights? When I started to consider this question, I, I thought I would be able to open a book and find a definitive answer, widely adopted and universally agreed. Unfortunately, this was not to be the case, particularly in the UK context. Whilst we've had many debates about the prospect of a UK Bill of Rights, the purpose of a Bill of Rights in the abstract is rarely, if at all, considered. But as I've already said, there's been all of these reports since the coming into the force of the, the Human Rights Act, in which the future direction of human rights protection is discussed. And if you read these very carefully, most of them will touch explicitly or implicitly on this question. Uh, so from this and, and from the relevant scholarship, I have three purposes I'm going to suggest for any Bill of Rights. And I'm not going to write them down on the screen. You're going to have to remember, but there's an image to go with each one. So first, a Bill of Rights must be an effective constraint on the exercise of power in order to protect human rights. Second, a Bill of Rights must be an important mechanism to assist a state to comply with the legal commitments it has made at the international level. And third, a Bill of Rights must be an indication, both nationally and internationally, of what a state stands for. 
and you'll see this also referred to as its symbolic value. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that this is what the UK stands for. It's just a, an image to remember. So while some of you may agree with my three purposes, I expect some of you won't or will have an issue with, with parts of each purpose. And that's to be expected. Um, to put your minds at rest for a little, I can now just touch on what I see as the, the contested parts of each purpose and how to deal with those issues of contestation. So I said, to remind you, my first purpose is this Bill of Rights must be an effective constraint on the exercise of power in order to protect human rights. But within that purpose, there are at least two serious contested issues. And the first is the definition of human rights, which are going to enjoy protection, and the second is the exercises of power that a Bill of Rights must protect against. Is that to be exclusively state power? Whether or not a Bill of Rights should protect against exercises of private power is a vitally important issue for us going forward. As the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Amazons of the world scoop up our private data and can, it's, it's becoming evident, provide a platform for distortions of the electoral process. But the prospect of a Bill of Rights in this country providing uh, protection against the exercises of private power is, is rarely, if at all, contemplated in the scholarship or in any of the reports I've mentioned. So I'm not gonna make it the focus of my lecture this evening. I'm instead going to consider in detail uh, the more hotly contested issue within the first purpose, which is which human rights should a Bill of Rights provide protection for? There is a very wide divergence between the list of human rights you will find in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the human rights protected by our Human Rights Act. Another point of contention arises when human rights are given further definition by an international court, such as the European Court of Human Rights. This court has adopted a living instrument approach to the convention, making words drafted in the 1950s, therefore relevant to contemporary society. And when that's translated into national law, there is a tendency and some to, to call it rights inflation, something that goes beyond the proper limits of judicial power, uh, something that is a threat to democracy and state sovereignty. So these are some, some very difficult issues and, and how to resolve those and move forward is, is something that has to be addressed. Rather than just muddle through, uh, my own answer is based on a, a variety of different things, international law, some pragmatism, a quick nod to philosophy. Surely a state must reflect in its Bill of Rights, if it's not reflected elsewhere, the obligations it's undertaken in international law including the obligation to abide by the judgments of an international court. Pragmatically, it's also important to appreciate that if a state attempts to isolate its, its national judiciary from developments in human rights law emanating from an international court or another national court, that's, that's just not really possible. It's not possible to prohibit national judges drawing on such jurisprudence without severely compromising the independence of the judiciary. Human rights is an idea that has caught on around the world and is not going to go away any time soon. Furthermore, most people would expect human rights law to protect them against serious threats to their interests. If these threats have evolved, so too must the law. 
So rather than trying to reach a definitive position on those two issues that's applicable to every, every different state, every country, my conclusion is that those, those two things must be left open to be determined by states within the constraints of the commitment that state has made in international law and serious threats to the interests of the people of that state. A purpose of the Bill of Rights remains to provide an effective constraint on the exercise of power in order to protect human rights. But states should determine for themselves within those limits what sorts of power, which human rights. My second purpose is a little more controversial. And I said that a Bill of Rights must be a mechanism a state can use to assist it in complying with the international commitments it has made at the, at the international level. And this is not a purpose widely reflected in scholarship, particularly in the UK, it, or in the reports I've mentioned, although it is important to remember, of course, that the Human Rights Act was designed to bring rights home from an international court and international legal system. This purpose, this link with international law, is also a purpose contested by some in its entirety. Dyson Hayden, for example, a former judge of the High Court of Australia, maintains that it's not a function of a Bill of Rights to help a state in its compliance with international standards. But looking around the world, it would appear that such an approach is very dated. Attributing importance to international commitments in contemporary constitutions around the world is, is common practice. States are not able to invoke their constitutions as hard as they try as an excuse for non-fulfillment of international obligations. And states such as the United Kingdom giving an account to bodies such as the UN Human Rights Council, as is happening in this slide, will always invoke their National Bill of Rights as the primary route via which national compliance is achieved. So the UK, earlier this year, in its report to the UN Human Rights Council, stated that its domestic framework for protecting and promoting human rights was largely based on the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act. But as this remains a contested purpose, I'll use the same method as I used previously to deal with this, this issue of disagreement. And the role played by a Bill of Rights in assisting a state to comply with its international obligations must be determined by states within the constraints of the commitment that state has made at the international level and serious threats to the interests of the people of that state. And with one small addendum that should a state consistently use its Bill of Rights in its communication with international institutions, that should also inform how that state's Bill of Rights should reflect international obligations. And I appreciate this does lead me uh, up a, a slight complication if a state has no commitments in international human rights law or chooses to get rid of its commitments in international human rights law, according to my reasoning, there should be no need for a Bill of Rights to assist it in helping to fulfil its international obligations. Conversely, should it have a number of commitments and regularly use its Bill of Rights in its reporting to international institutions, it's only reasonable to expect that the Bill of Rights should have this international role. My third and final purpose for a Bill of Rights is not contested at all. And there is universal agreement that a Bill of Rights has symbolic value, an indication nationally and internationally of what a state stands for. In its 2008 report, the Joint Committee on Human Rights stated that the adoption of Bill of Rights provided a moment when society can define itself and that a Bill of Rights should set out a shared vision of a desirable future society. Bills of Rights should map where people want to go, not where they are at. So, I've established the purposes for a Bill of Rights. I've dealt with the issues of contestation. 
the second part of my lecture, I will consider what a UK Bill of Rights fit for purpose should look like. But before I do that, I have to obviously deal with the contested issues in the UK context. So I've said that the definition of human rights to be protected, the types of power we need to provide protection against, and the role the Bill of Rights plays in the international system and the international obligations a state has accepted must be determined by states within the constraints of the commitment that state has made at the international level and threats to the interests of the people of that state. So there are a number of difficult questions for the UK when we, we look at these issues of contestation. One of the most difficult is the UK's confusing relationship with international human rights law. In particular, the international treaties it has ratified, and I don't just mean the European Convention on Human Rights, but also the European Social Charter, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I think for the UK, real commitment to these treaties must be expressed in a Bill of Rights, and no commitment must be similarly expressed. But this is, this is a little difficult. At present, our relationship with these uh, laws and obligations is not clear. You'll be familiar with the UK's ongoing failure to implement the judgment of the Grand Chamber of the European Court that the blanket ban on prisoner voting is incompatible with Article 3, Protocol 1 of the Convention. And this, I admit, is a failure about to be partially addressed by the plans to give prisoners on release on temporary license the right to vote. And the last time I checked, I, I saw that this was a plan which is estimated to affect 100 prisoners. Um, so it's, it's not a really kind of heartfelt measure of compliance. The Parliamentary Committee, which reported on this in 2013, I think rightly said that the UK must implement this judgment or de-ratify the European Convention on Human Rights. Existing in this very cautious grey space between partial and full commitment, the European Court of Human Rights careful not to upset the UK, I think is, is not really any longer satisfactory and makes any move to a new Bill of Rights very difficult. And we have to also add to this the suggestion from Theresa May in her 2016 speech, and obviously this wasn't her 2016 speech, and I desperately tried to make those letters fall off somehow, but <laughs> there's a special treat at the end. Um, that her speech in 2016 that the UK should leave the ECHR, uh, but not the EU. Although this didn't feature, to be fair, it's, it wasn't repeated in the Conservative Party manifesto prior to the election earlier this year. Nor has there been any suggestion more recently that the UK should de-ratify the other human rights treaties I have mentioned, apart, of course, from leaving the European Union and all of the commitments that come with that. So, with that difficult issue, I'm, I'm going to assume that the UK remains committed to fulfilling the international obligations in human rights law it has undertaken. And I'll also take into account our foreign policy, a part of which is a commitment to stand up for human rights. So secondly, in the UK context, I've also said that one way of dealing with contested issues is to assume that a National Bill of Rights is going to address serious threats to the interests of the people of that country. For the people of the UK, obviously there are a number of threats. But I, I have to pick a couple, otherwise we could be here all night. Um, two stand out at the present time. Brexit and rising inequality as a result, in part, of austerity measures. Our departure from the EU is a threat to the interests of the people of the UK 
not experienced in a number of generations. Not only is it almost certain that the right to freedom of movement and establishment in other member states will be lost, but also the oversight and protection of the institutions of the European Union, as well as the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, a much more modern human rights instrument than the European Convention on Human Rights, as it includes protection for economic, social, and cultural rights. Now we get to the part where I read out the EU Withdrawal Bill. <laughs> These losses are not addressed in the EU Withdrawal Bill. And as you know, this has been a big issue in the last couple of days in the House of Commons, and I am not going to bore you to death with the details of this very complex and difficult bill. Just to summarise, it freezes in time EU law for us at the point of departure. It does nothing to protect us against a wholesale dismantling by our own parliament and government ministers of the protection for human rights, including economic and social rights, built up by EU law over, over many years. The second threat is rising inequality. In its concluding observations on the UK published in 2016, the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights stated its concern about the disproportionate adverse impact that austerity measures introduced in 2010 are having on the enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights by disadvantaged and marginalised individuals and groups. In January this year, the Resolution Foundation reported that inequality in this country is only worsening and the outlook is not positive. It predicted falling living standards from almost the entire bottom half of the working age income distribution, whilst incomes in the top half are projected to grow. It concluded that in the next few years, we'll see the biggest rise in inequality since the 1980s, with inequality after housing costs reaching record highs by 2020. So having dealt with the purpose of a Bill of Rights, how to overcome these issues of contestation, I'm now going to move to the third part of my lecture. Do we have a Bill of Rights in the UK? And if not, what do we do to secure a Bill of Rights fit for purpose? Don't get me wrong. The Human Rights Act clearly meets many of the purposes of a Bill of Rights I have outlined. It operates as a generally effective constraint on the exercise of legislative, executive and judicial power in order to protect a range of human rights. Human rights of vulnerable and marginalised groups have been upheld by courts even in the most politically contested areas. Helen Ray has done some research and, and concluded that the Human Rights Act has significantly dented pub government power to control family-related migration in an area of policy that had previously been almost entirely closed to successful legal challenge. The Human Rights Act has helped the UK to project an image abroad as a state which respects human rights, at least civil and political rights, and provides effective remedies for violations in the national legal system. And it clearly assists the UK in complying with the commitments it has made under a variety of international human rights treaties, such as the European Convention on Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But there is room for improvement. But as I've already said, optimism on the topic disappeared in 2010, replaced by the suspicion that opening the doors to a UK Bill of Rights would only lead to a weakening in protection. So I, I will admit that approaching the debate with some caution is warranted. But it's also important that current reticence doesn't lead to a position that human rights protection in this country is stuck in a rut, unable to respond to current threats, vulnerable to, vulnerable to attacks, and just waiting to be gutted or repealed. So using the Human Rights Act as a starting point and with the underlying assumptions that the UK will remain committed 
at least to its international human rights obligations, and a Bill of Rights will address the threats represented by Brexit and rising inequality. In this th last part of my lecture, in the final part, utilising the three purposes, goes for some time, the final part, don't you? Um, as I've already set out, I will consider what features a UK Bill of Rights must have in order to be fit for purpose. So, my first purpose, it has to be this effective constraint on the exercise of power in order to protect human rights. And a consistent feature in discussions about the Human Rights Act is that it is insufficient to deal with a variety of threats to human interests. And this is not just the threats represented by Brexit and inequality. In 2008, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission stated that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland needed to contain stronger rights to equality and uh, prohibition of discrimination. Joint Committee on Human Rights has called for the inclusion of rights to health, education, housing, adequate standard of living, <coughs> and some protection from pollution, the right to a healthy and sustainable environment. The list of human rights protected by the Human Rights Act clearly doesn't encompass all of the rights the UK has committed itself to in international law to protect. And these economic, social and cultural rights, the need to protect those is now even more pressing given Brexit and rising inequality. The UK is also increasingly out of step with other democracies in not offering stronger protection to a broader range of rights. I've read recently that 67% of the constitutions of the world have a provision addressing health or health care. And whilst, of course, in the UK, some of these rights may continue to be addressed indirectly, there's a much better chance of securing respect and for these rights to gain traction where it's actually written down somewhere in a Bill of Rights indicating national commitment and guiding legislators and administrators in their work. Waiting for the European Court of Human Rights to fill the gap is pointless. Given its predominantly civil and political rights remit, the Court has moved very cautiously in this field. Considered it considers national courts at the forefront of any developments. And of course, there have been a few claims under the Human Rights Act which have been successful in combating the worst features of austerity, but there hasn't really been widespread success. Were a Bill of Rights to include, for example, a freestanding equality guarantee, this would enable courts to address inequality with better tools than that provided by Article 14 of the European Convention. If we were to include specific protection for economic and social rights and to have a debate about that from the very outset, this would avoid the accusation that judges in the limited uh, jurisprudence there has been about austerity measures are overstepping the boundaries by twisting civil and political rights into essentially Social, social rights. And of course, the inclusion of broadening out to include this type of right would also go some way towards filling the substantive gap in protection that will be created by Brexit, although of course the procedural gap will remain. The second issue within the first purpose, that a Bill of Rights must be an effective constraint on the exercise of power is effectiveness. And it's well known that the Human Rights Act has an effectiveness flaw at its heart, the Section 4 Declaration of Incompatibility. And this is the only remedy that is available where there is a clear incompatibility between a convention right and an act of parliament. And this is not an effective remedy as compared to remedies in other comparable democracies and it's also not considered to be an effective remedy by the European Court of Human Rights. 
For now, this weakness is sometimes alleviated when an act of parliament also contains, um, also covers an area of EU law and conflicts with human rights. And here, the, as the Supreme Court recently did in its Bank of Bush judgment, the section can be set aside. But this is not a remedy which will be retained by the EU withdrawal bill. But this, despite this ineffectiveness at the heart of the Human Rights Act, this really hasn't been the subject of much debate in the UK. Even those pushing for a UK Bill of Rights up until 2010 didn't challenge this feature, and it was just said to be an unavoidable consequence of a sovereign parliament. Indeed, in recent years, the debate that has taken place has focused on the notion that judges have too much power. Under the Human Rights Act, and, and generally, and that, as has been suggested by some, in any new Bill of Rights, sections three and four must not feature. Such mistaken notions about the strength of an ineffective remedy have also made their way to the Supreme Court, where a majority found the ban on assisted suicide to be incompatible with Article 8, but only two judges were willing to issue a declaration of incompatibility. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on the very limited nature of many of the arguments made against Sections 3 and 4 of the Human Rights Act. I, just, just to summarise, we could say most suffer from a deluded confidence that, uninformed by empirical evidence, that Parliament can do a better job with human rights than the courts. It's assumed that democracy, via indirect participation, will flourish, forgetting to mention all of those who might not get an indirect say via Parliament, such as, for the moment, those aged under 18, prisoners, and, at least in the Brexit referendum, EU nationals living in the UK. But the voices calling for a reduction in judicial power are now so strident, it's important to ask the question, can a Bill of Rights leaning more in favour of Parliament than the courts still constitute an effective constraint? Is it possible for a Bill of Rights to be fit for purpose if courts cannot do anything about acts of Parliament which clearly breach human rights? And I think the answer has to be definitely not. Such a Bill of Rights would ensure that Parliament's interpretation of human rights, despite any political motivation, was even more difficult than it is under the Human Rights Act to remedy, perhaps impossible to ever remedy. And it would also place the UK in direct breach of its international obligations. But I think, to be fair, whilst sections three and four or equivalents must be retained in any Bill of Rights, it is possible to ensure that Parliament plays a far greater role in scrutinising law for human rights compatibility than it does at present. There could be measures such as reason statements of compatibility, uh, making the power of legislative override explicit, the possibility of timetables following declarations of incompatibility. And should Parliament really want its perspective afforded more respect, I think it's only reasonable, rather than reducing the power of the courts, more must be done to guarantee that Parliament engages effectively and meaningfully with the human rights issues at stake. My second purpose for the, a Bill of Rights in the UK was that it should be an important mechanism to assist a state comply with the legal commitments it is made at the international level. And here the Human Rights Act is already partially fit for purpose in that it assists the UK to comply with commitments predominantly in relation to civil and political rights. But it doesn't assist the UK in directly complying with its international commitments in relation to a number of other rights in particular economic, social and cultural rights. And this is a focus of this recent report. There is a gap 
here that a bill of rights fit for purpose could fill. It's also possible that a bill of rights could regulate the relationship between national and international law a little differently to the model established by the Human Rights Act, but still help the UK to achieve its commitments. It's not necessary for a National Bill of Rights to replicate the exact wording of an international instrument like the Human Rights Act does. It's also not necessary to include a directive to courts, such as we have with Section 2 of the Human Rights Act, on how to interpret and apply international jurisprudence. An international judiciary should be able Oh, sorry, an independent judiciary should be able to draw inspiration from a wide range of sources whilst also being mindful of a state's international commitments. Whilst a new language of rights protection and no explicit directive to follow the judgments of an international court might result in a very nationally focused uh, Bill of Rights, I think Human rights law is a little different to other areas of law. Common standards have spread around the world. National and international judges everywhere are interpreting and applying human rights, and these developments are widely shared. I think even if our UK Bill of Rights were to include no guidance on international law, human rights adjudication by an independent and impartial national judiciary we continue to be influenced by the human rights jurisprudence of international courts and other national courts. And it would be an unusual Bill of Rights indeed, as I've said before, were it to ban national judges from having regard to a wide range of sources in its interpretation and application. It's also important for the, for the UK Bill of Rights to make clearer that international law operates as a floor rather than a ceiling. And this will avoid the problem that's been identified by some, that UK judges feel they have no mandate to take the European Convention on Human Rights forward in directions not supported by existing case law. It's important to make provision for the possibility that UK judges will be able to use the Bill of Rights to stretch beyond convention jurisprudence and offer improved protection for rights through law at the national level. However, one note of caution, international human rights law standards remain important, and this is a, a demonstration in Poland. While it's desirable for the National Bill of Rights to be independent of international guarantees, should these not reach as far as a national jurisprudence would like to, and to also have the ability for national jurisprudence to move swiftly where required, rather than being in lockstep with a system that can only move forward very slowly. This is not to suggest that a state must de-ratify international treaties in order to move forward with national human rights protection, particularly if there's really no desire to move forward, but actually to adopt regressive interpretations. Left to their own devices, of course, it is possible for states to adopt lesser protections for human rights. It's also important to appreciate that a Bill of Rights can actually help a state meet its international commitments at the same time as securing respect for the national position. And over the years, UK judges are becoming far more adept at carefully adjudicating in human rights claims so as to secure respect for their work should it end up being reviewed by the European Court of Human Rights. UK courts can now exert strong influence on the court, changing the course of convention jurisprudence for all contracting states and helping to ensure that where the UK wants to maintain a national position on a particular issue, such as policing of demonstrations, as the example here of kettling, and um, advertising, political advertising, that is far more possible than might previously have been the case. Much of the criticism of the European Court of Human Rights is stuck in a prisoner voting time warp. 
with little appreciation that the, human, that the European court itself is changing and allowing more freedom for states to adopt flexible and nationally focused interpretations of convention guarantees and jurisprudence. Now, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing could be the subject of a, a whole other lecture, but we'll assume that uh, it's a good thing just for the purpose of, of the lecture this evening. The court clearly does take account of the processes and practices before national institutions when it's determining the margin of appreciation. Thorough analysis of these issues by Parliament and UK courts is likely to secure respect in Strasbourg. So it makes sense that a Bill of Rights is designed to take advantage of them and promoting subsidiarity by ensuring strong human rights consideration in the legislature, in the executive, and making sure that courts also have the same tools to deal with human rights complaints as are used by the European Court of Human Rights. So my final purpose was, was that of symbolic value, the strong symbolic value that a UK Bill of Rights should have. So it can signal to the people of the UK and elsewhere what the UK stands for. As I've already said, this is a purpose on which there is unanimous agreement. A Bill of Rights is an important statement. It's likely to remain in place for many years, and so careful thought must go into its content and what message it will send. And this purpose is also closely connected to my first and second purposes. Should a Bill of Rights expressly, guarantee, expressly contradict the guarantees of international human rights law, the message will be that the UK does not respect the international rule of law. Should a Bill of Rights trample all over what the people of the different countries of the United Kingdom would like, this would send a message that the UK is in effect a unitary state, controlled from Westminster with little regard to or little respect for the wishes of the people of its constituent countries and legislatures and executives. Conversely, should a Bill of Rights offer protection to a much wider set of human rights, reflecting international commitments and filling the gap in protection created by Brexit, the message would be that the UK is a progressive and outward-looking nation, willing to embrace a modern human rights instrument and ensure that any reductions in protection created by our exit from an international organisation are fully and quickly addressed. Given recent discussions, the latter message uh, doesn't seem likely. And there are three messages that uh, a Bill of Rights could potentially send, which I think are, are best avoided. The first is, is British exceptionalism. And this has been a theme of politicians from all shades of the, the political spectrum. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown portrayed Britain as a heroic leader willing to fight for the values it believes in. Uh, by contrast, former Prime Minister David Cameron defined Britishness against the European other. And both perspectives obviously could be captured in different bills of rights. Brown's vision would translate to a Bill of Rights that went beyond the European Convention on Human Rights and placed the UK on the world stage as a leader in the national protection of human rights. British exceptionalism could symbolise the importance of protecting human rights through law and going beyond international guarantees. Cameron's vision could also translate to more generous protection for human rights, but all of the signs to date indicate that distinguishing national human rights protection from European human rights protection is more likely to be achieved via less generous protection at the national level. The second symbolic message best to avoid is the lack of respect for international law and institutions. Obviously, for the UK to express this through its Bill of Rights would set an appalling example particularly for those states the UK is keen to encourage to respect human rights themselves. And it's also important to avoid the message which was suggested by some a few years ago that human rights must be dependent upon the fulfilment of responsibilities. As Lord Hope said in a judgment in 2009, human rights are not just for some people, they are for everyone, 
no matter how dangerous, however disgusting, however despicable, is excluded. Those who have no respect for the rule of law, even those who seek to destroy it, are in the same position as everyone else. So, what next for a Bill of Rights? I'm finishing up now, Daniel. According to the present government, nothing at all. We could sit and wait whilst a vast gap in protection is opened up as a result of our exit from the EU and express surprise when our legal system it is unable to remedy or even begin to address the threat to human rights that results. All demands could be made now for a UK Bill of Rights fit for purpose. This must be an effective constraint on the exercise of power in order to protect human rights. It must assist the UK in complying with the commitments it's made in international human rights law, and it must symbolise what the UK stands for. The Human Rights Act is an excellent starting point, already in many respects a Bill of Rights fit for purpose. But given the threats presented by Brexit and rising inequality, as well as all of these commitments the UK has made in international law which remain unimplemented, there is room for improvement. A new UK Bill of Rights must first clarify the UK's relationship with international human rights law. Are we in or are we out? It must also expand the range of human rights protected by including economic, social and cultural rights in order to improve effective protection against current threats and assist the UK in living up to the commitments it has made in international human <coughs> rights law. It's an opportunity to make clear that international law operates as a floor, not a ceiling, and also confirm that acts of parliament inconsistent with human rights cannot place, be placed beyond the review of the courts. There must always be effective remedies. To allay the often expressed fears about threats to sovereignty, Parliament could be given a more detailed formal role in human rights compliance. This will meet international commitments, but also do more to secure respect for the national position on certain issues where this is deserving of respect. And finally, this is a moment for the people of the UK to use a Bill of Rights to map where they want to go, not where they are at. It is important not to send a negative message about British exceptionalism, lack of respect for international law and institutions, or place responsibilities above rights. The message that this new Bill of Rights must deliver is that the UK is a world leader in the protection of human rights respects and follows the international rule of law and is a strong advocate of the fundamental principle that human rights are for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> say a huge thank you to Maris for what um, I'm absolutely sure everyone agrees shows quite what a worthy professor of human rights law she is. Um, and now, as she says, <laughs> time for a drink right outside. So thank you very much. Thank you.